Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading from Isaiah, the basis for our message, is a a very personal and intimate poem about God's love for his people and and also for uh, the land where he promised his people. It's it's really a, a love story, almost a parable of the love between God and Israel. And this whole part of the second half of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66, it's written to Israel after, it's addressed to them after they've uh, gone into exile. That's when it's, um, Isaiah is aiming at that. And the exile, uh, if you don't remember, that started around 586, C, 586 B.C. when Babylon came in and gutted Jerusalem and they carried off uh, the most precious items of Solomon's temple, burned much of Jerusalem to the ground, and nearly all of Jerusalem's most influential and and capable leaders, well, they were either killed or marched off to Babylon. In other words, the city was utterly ruined. Uh, Its remaining citizens were traumatized. It would take centuries, or at least a century, uh, to even get a start really, of a concerted effort, politically and divine intervention as well, in order for Jerusalem to begin to bounce back. I mean, it's, it's not that far from, if you were to imagine what, it would, what an undertaking would be to rebuild a place like Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Jerusalem would need to be built from the ground up. And yet, Isaiah proclaims Yahweh's promise to restore the land. Isaiah, in fact, repeatedly throughout his book refers to Zion. And Zion is God's pet name for the city of Jerusalem. Uh, last May, I was, going, I was going to Fort Wayne, where I spent much of my uh, later childhood growing up. And for the first time, I think in probably 20 years, I, I stopped by one of the houses where I grew up in. Now, um, I couldn't go inside, but I I really wanted to. I I wanted to to walk through the rooms that I had grown up in, go into my old bedroom and the basement. I wanted to see what had changed and and reminisce a little. But it's probably best (laughs) that my wife discouraged me from being a creeper and a trespasser in my old home. Um, Nevertheless, our home where we come from is very personal to us. That's why, for for some of you at least, it may feel so good to finally be able to cheer for a a Bengals playoff victory, or why some of you are so, uh, so, love your Bearcats so much. You know, home, where we come from, uh, makes a difference. But it goes, I would suggest it goes even a step further for the Jews of the Old Testament in particular. Because Jerusalem was the place where Yahweh, the Lord Almighty, had had specifically actually told them out loud to live. In fact, Yahweh promised that if Israel was faithful to him, he would dwell with them, live with them in Jerusalem, dwelling in the temple. Israel had, had, in fact, entered into a covenantal relationship with Yahweh. And it was really a lot like marriage. And that's why throughout the Old Testament... Uh, we see God using marriage and love language to describe his relationship with them. They had even made their vows and signed the equivalent of the Bronze Age paperwork to make it all official and above board. Now, it seems like I'm, uh, it's a bit, become a bit of a thing, in, in maybe just in Hollywood, um, discussing open marriages. Well, Yahweh wasn't interested in an open marriage with Israel. It was an exclusive relationship. Yahweh was very clear about his expectations and commitment that would be involved. Uh, Plus, it wasn't just a covenant with only Abraham. It was a covenant meant to be available to all of the Israelites. Uh, And that's what That's what circumcision was all about. It was kind of like circumcision was opting in to the plan. Circumcision was a very personal 
and family signature to be part of the covenant people of Abraham. And, and for women, it meant committing to only marrying a, a Jewish man faithful to Yahweh. I think it's helpful to remember that it seems to be that in the ancient world, and particularly for God's people if they listened to him, that they, they thought more in terms of families than in isolated individuals. I mean, you might, you can make the argument that our society is, has a fascination, a hyper fascination with individualism, uh, but I'd make the argument that that's what's really out of whack. It's, it not only can be narcissistic, it's often downright idolatrous. But my point is this, the Abrahamic covenant, you know, the, the Old Testament covenant, it was never really about genetics or ethnicity. That was not the core. It was meant to be, like in marriage, it was meant to be an ongoing commitment. And that's why for Jews, circumcision and marriage were not just personal decisions. They were opportunities to be faithful to Yahweh. God had made all of Abraham's descendants eligible to be part of his covenant people, but they had to be uh, they had to opt in. They had to be circumcised or married to someone who was circumcised to be in the covenant. Now, as it, this is a bit of a side note, but I, I don't want anyone to get confused. Circumcision is very clearly not the sign of being a member of the new covenant that you and I are a part of. It really doesn't have any you know, specifically Christian significance. No, what matters is baptism. Baptism into Christ is the entrance into the new covenant. And, and the Lord's Supper is an ongoing connection and sign and promise to us that we are part of the, the new covenant. These are the new signs and sacraments. Um, all of this is why it's so fitting that Isaiah uses marriage language to describe the relationship between God and his people. In the Old Testament, God had been married to his people, even specifically to the land of Jerusalem. And yet, that's what made the Babylonian exile so uh, horrific and eye-opening. During the Babylonian exile, the land had been desolated, uh, abandoned by Yahweh and by almost everyone else, too. Practically, the only people who, were, who frequented Jerusalem immediately after the Babylonian destruction were looters, the destitute, and other criminals. Uh, a major aim of Isaiah's prophecies are to communicate with the Jews in exile that this punishment was no accident. Israel had abandoned the covenant. They had been unfaithful and, they had, uh, and brazen adulterers with many foreign nations and gods, even though they had agreed right from the start that, that's, that they were going to be in a relationship solely with Yahweh. And since Israel had long since abandoned a faithful marriage with Yahweh, Yahweh eventually, at least temporarily, abandoned them. And when Yahweh left Israel, they no longer were enjoying his protection, which they had taken for granted. And so Yahweh, uh, Yahweh had loved his wife Israel, but when Israel left Yahweh, she did not find love. She was dominated and abused by ruthless foreign lovers. And yet, lacking all good sense and respect for his own heart and well-being, Yahweh was going to return to the bride of his youth. His love was too sincere and deep to stay away too long. Yahweh's beloved, if estranged wife Israel, was now in serious trouble. Yet Yahweh would return to her. He would speak tenderly to her, even if she didn't deserve it. Though she had been impure, he would treat her with compassion and deep concern. He would rebuild her. He would dress her wounds, comforting her, even though much of her pain was self-inflicted and, and actually a betrayal of him. Nevertheless, Yahweh would heal her. This is the kind of love that our Lord has. It's a deep an enduring love for you. God is committed to, to, to us, to redeeming this world, even if this world 
regularly disrespects, insults, and attacks, and attacks the love of God. And we know this is certainly what would happen to our Lord and Savior. Uh, Jesus came and to repair a broken relationship. In fact, uh, Jesus' first sign in the book of John, which we just read, is turning water into wine. Now, it's more than simply helping people party here. Uh, this miracle points to the marriage of God and his people. As I said, this is a, a common theme, both in the Old and the New Testament. The groom and the bride in that story, they're never, they're never mentioned by name, right? And that's because they're not really who the story is about. It's, it's about the marriage of Yahweh to his people. About, it's about God's commitment and his return to Israel. Well, Jesus' concern and desire for addressing and repairing this broken relationship between God and the world, uh, we begin to see throughout the New Testament, can, can be seen in so many different ways in his preaching and correction, his healing, teaching, but most especially in his passion. What a, an appropriate name for describing what God has done for us in Christ. The passion of Christ. Christ upon the cross. Our God, after all, is passionate about being reconciled to us. It's not just a math equation that he's going to fix. It's that he loves us, that he's passionate about us. The cross is not just an event. It's a proclamation of God's love, greater than any poem or love song or bouquet. He's committed to us, even when the world is unfaithful or attacking or insulting and killing him. He loves us even unto death, even unto his own death. You know, we should know better, but sometimes we too, we're uncooperative or perhaps we're ungrateful and sometimes we too are unfaithful. We speak and act as if we were of the world, not of Christ. We do things that are wicked, cruel, and self-serving. And we willingly expose ourselves to sin and wickedness. Yet, even in the pain brought on by our own sin, our, lo our Lord is not above comforting and healing us. Isaiah's motto to exiled Israel could be summed up in the uh, iconic chapter 40, where Yahweh says, comfort, comfort, says my people, so says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. It was for our unfaithfulness that Christ was crucified. However, it was not the, the nails or the, soldier, or, the, or the soldiers that kept Christ on the cross. It was his love, his passion for you, to bring you forgiveness and love. And that's why we can, with Isaiah, say, Behold, your salvation comes. It came to Jerusalem as Christ returned to Jerusalem on Holy Week. And because of that, we know that we are redeemed and made whole because of God's great, committed, passionate suffering and death for you. Whether you are quarantined or mourning your sin or struggling in relationships, you need not be alone. Behold, your Savior comes to you. Christ will come with you, and he will never abandon you. Only with Christ, not even death, will do us part. In Jesus' name, amen.